Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, another round of fellows talks. Um, uh, first up, we have Max. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Max. I'm from UC Berkeley. And this summer, I worked with Joh Johannes Ludium and Heather Gray. And my project was charge particle track finding with MCTS. For some motivation and background, uh, the originally this project's proposal was more open-ended and exploratory. We're looking for, or I guess, looking for any promising avenues to investigate track reconstruction algorithms that integrate machine learning and common filtering. And common filtering is important because, of course, it integrates our domain knowledge of the field, both statistical and, of course, related to physics. For machine learning to utilize the improved GPU architecture, and for, of course, intractable intractable pattern recognition. And so basically, I guess more, spe more specifically, we're looking for something like a similar in structure to the immensely successful combinatorial common filter, but with strong machine learning heuristics that either improve its performance or speed. And what we went with, at least primarily, is going with a Monte Carlo tree search approach basically treating tracking as a decision problem where as you're propagating your track candidate, you are selecting which hit to, pa which hit to propagate to as this kind of uh, single, choice decision, the single choice decision problem. The Monte Carlo tree search is basically an algorithm that uses random playouts for optimal action selection. And so you have this decision tree, which edges are iteratively updated with these playouts so that the promising actions are brought forward and the bad actions are suppressed. And so there are some advantages specifically for tracking and why this was, this was introduced is because common filtering can be pretty easily integrated with this in that it requires the, the MCTS requires you to evaluate prior probabilities on each edge of the decision tree and that's very similar to in the CDKF when we evaluate uh, iterative chi-squared for each propagating edge. And also the MCTS aggressively prunes the search space. It only focuses on, at least depending on the networks, what it considers promising avenues. So this should hopefully bring about scalability, but of course this will have to be further studied and of course, it, since MCTS iteratively redu reduces uncertainty, you can, you can have it adapted to different requirements depending on the stage of reconstruction, whether it's offline or online, or what your requirements are. And so there are two neural networks that are primarily at work here. There's a policy network, which is very simple. It just takes in a pair of hits on adjacent layers, or turns how likely they are to be part of the same track. We use this to assign prior probabilities for a new a new hit that we're considering for our track candidate. And there's the evaluation network, which just takes an entire list of hits in a sequence and returns how likely it is to be a valid track. And this is a, just a written algorithm description, a rhythm disc written description of the algorithm. But I think it's probably more useful if I just walk through an example. And so here is a very simple nine layer telescope detector with with amion events. And we can, since it's very simple to detect the geometry, we can make a lot of assumptions about it since there's a clear hierarchy of, of layers. We don't have to consider things like uh, J, uh, layers perpendicular to each other, like in a track null detector or something like that. So we can see in the first iteration, we pick a single hit on the first layer or I guess more appropriately in the future, it'd be a track seed. And then we probably just open it up and assign each layer, each hit on the next layer of prior probability with the policy network. Then we move on to the second iteration. We see we go, we descend our little tree so far, and we expand to hit one of our leaf nodes and execute a Monte Carlo playout, which you can see as the yellow line. And the playout you can see is very obviously not that good because it's supposed to be done quickly. And the idea is that after many iterations, they should converge to optimal decisions. 
And we can see that after the third iteration and fourth iteration, it's building in the right direction. We can see that at the bottom here, it's probably not that visible, but the, the edges that are incorrect are, iterative, are iteratively suppressed and the one that is supposed to be correct is brought, is brought forward. And so after multiple iterations, it becomes more and more sure of itself for the edges that it's been through. And so after six iterations, we can see the, the true track kind of come, out, come forward. Of course, at the end of the tree, it's not gonna be very accurate, but that's not particularly important because we're primarily concerned about the edge at the bottom of the tree. And so with 10 more iterations, we see that it developed this web of edges. And we can see that at the bottom, it's probability of that particular edge is very high. And you can see at the top that it strays off and that's completely on purpose. The algorithm is, uh, is encouraged to explore. So once it reaches the end of its most promising, I guess, primary variation, you will search for other variations, other alternatives and check if they are, if they are possible or if they are at all good so that it makes sure it doesn't, it kind of checks its work so that it doesn't miss anything. So once you get to this kind of point, you can lock in an edge at the bottom once you have a higher high certainty that, that that's the case, and then repeat the process from hit on the next layer. Well, you can see that because of the way we chose this tree structure, all the playouts that went through that, that hit are conserved. So you don't need nearly as many iterations the second time around. So you're saving a lot of work. And there's some preliminary testing for this. We you can see on the table on the right, the, 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 the plots I showed, I actually used a policy network that it was purposely made weaker than it actually is. When, I tr when you train the policy, when you train the policy network right now, it actually performs extremely well. You know, as you can see, uh, efficiency and purity over 99%. And so that the reason I purposely chose a bad network is to kind of show the structure. Otherwise, it would just go straight and converge directly to the right answer. Wouldn't be that interesting to look at. But you can see that if I choose just a random policy network, so I guess the worst case scenario, you can see that the MCTS structure actually significantly improves, significantly improves performance. But you see with the very high performance policy network, it actually does a little bit worse. So of course, this is something we'll have to continue to investigate. But we, this does show that it's promising that the structure of the MCTS does bring out something extra so that it can make up for weaknesses in the policy network alone. And so for improvements in future directions, yeah, of course, we're working with a very simplified data set right now. It's just a simulated telescope detector. So it doesn't consider noise hits, it doesn't consider fact skipping layers. Of course, this will have to be taken into account in the future. And the policy network can be split into two different networks. It can be one that's fast for the Monte Carlo play, or one that's slow for assigning the prior probabilities. If you notice that those are actually two different tasks. And the common filtering should be integrated. Right now it's not actually, because as you can see right now, the, the policy network actually performs well even without common filtering at all. So We'll have to see as we do more stress testing, move on to more realistic, more realistic data sets that becomes necessary. And of course, the goal is eventually to apply this to more sophisticated detector geometry, like the track model detector or something, and with higher density events, so they can really we can really investigate if this is a promising avenue of research. And of course, we'll have to we'll have to develop more precise benchmarks so that if it's see how it compares to existing algorithms and other perhaps pure machine learning algorithms like the GNNs. But all in all, we have done, over the summer we've demonstrated that this is a novel and perhaps promising avenue for developing a new class of reconstruction algorithm. Uh, any questions? Uh, thank you, Max. Uh, Alex, you have a question? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks a lot for this interesting talk. Um, one thing that is sometimes a consideration with tracking algorithms is the sort of runtime, how computationally expensive uh, they are, depending on the application. 
I was wondering, is this uh, a consideration behind this approach? Was this sort of a topic uh, in this project at all? Or is this sort of more of a fundamental investigation of whether this approach is, is feasible? Yeah, I mean, it definitely is more naive just focusing on if it's feasible. But a big reason why this was chosen was because you have total control over how many iterations per, I guess, decision that you do. So that in, in reality, like if you're scaling up, say you're more, more particles per event, you, if you use the same amount of iterations, it's constant time. So, but, you know, as we would expect is that as you have more hits, I guess, higher density of hits, you would require more iterations and that how that scales is we'll have to see. The reason why this was chosen, I, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, is that the Monte Carlo tree search prunes out most of the search tree. So like unlike the CKF, which entertains almost all hypotheses until they're in, until they're eliminated, this the MCTS is a lot more conservative about uh, what what hypotheses it entertains. Although of course the downside is that it's not as parallelizable, but those are concerns for the future. Great, thank you very much. Any other questions for Max? All right, uh, thank you, Max. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Peter Rodolfi. I'll be presenting today on the PyHF to combine converter software that I wrote. Um, I want to thank my mentors, uh, Matthew, Dr. Matthew Fiker and Dr. Alexander Held for mentoring me through this project. Um, so let's get started. So <clears throat> the motivation of the project, um, again, PyHF and Combine are essentially st the statistical tools that we're using on the ATLAS and CMS experiments um, to kind of represent the data that are being developed or are being collected in those experiments. There's some differences between the two uh, models though. So PyHF is kind of more lightweight than Combine. So it's easier, faster to use, um, but it doesn't have the kind of nuances that Combine offers. Um, Combine has a lot more options for the user to use and a lot more ways you can uh, kind of analyze and display the data. Um, so there's kind of a trade-off there. And in order for people to be able to take advantage of one model or the other, they need to be able to understand how to use both, but that's not really practical um, right now. So we kind of need a quick translation to be able to, so that people can easily take advantage of either uh, model. So the overview of the project, we want to get a bi-directional bi translation between PyCHEF and Combine. Um, the main part of that is kind of translating between the different formats for the model specifications. So PyHF uses this thing called His Factory JSON specifications, which is basically just uh, JSON where you're um, giving the explicit data and uh, modifiers and uncertainties and all of that. And then Combine has something called a data card, which is a text file. And it's basically, the it's giving the same information, but in a different format. Uh, so we need to be able to translate between those two things. Um, this is kind of straightforward to do in terms of the data because both of the specifications are based on histograms and like pure counts. Um, so kind of the translation of data is is rather straightforward. But in terms of the uncertainties and the building blocks that these models use, um, we need to convert those, and it's not always. Uh, as straightforward to, to do that conversion. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, Combine has all of these extra things that the user can do that PyHF might not have. Um, so we need to handle that in the translation as well to tell the user that, you know, there's something in the data card that they can't translate to PyHF. So here's some examples. Um, on the left, we have a combined data card um, with, you know, we have our channel, our different processes that we're measuring and the uncertainty. Um, and then on the right, 
in the uh, JSON spec in uh, PyHF. And we also have, you can see the channel, the uh, modifiers of so the uncertainty um, and the sample names. So it, when you want to run the translation, um, I designed it to be run in an environment where you can use both combine and PyHF commands um, so that you can kind of take advantage of both of those interfaces to make the translation as efficient as possible. Um, so you need to use, or I uh, kind of designed it to be used in a Docker container. Um, instructions to do that is on my GitHub page, but essentially the reason for using a Docker container is because that's like kind of the easiest and the best way to attach the combine, install the combine commands um, and allow them to be used with the translation. Um, so it's pretty easily run from the command line. Um, you just need to input either the JSON or the data card file, and then it'll translate to the other one. Um, one caveat is that if you're going from PyHF or combined to PyHF and you have like multiple bins, so histograms, um, you need to include the shapes file that's kind of separate um, from the data card in the command line um, command. And that'll tell, you know, the program what histograms are being included in the data. So uh, for going from PyChef to combine, uh, we need to parse through this JSON model and then translate it to a data card object. Um, so co combine has this data card object already written. Um, so it's so we can just take advantage of that and the attributes that it already has. Um, so once we populate the object with all these things from the JSON, um, we can then manually write out the text file, um, just accessing each attribute of the object. Um, there's not a method currently written to, to do this, so I had to do it manually. Um, we also need to generate the histograms and put them in the sh separate shapes root file. Um, so in PyHF, uh, the JSON specification is just, the data is explicitly given. Um, but for combine, there's kind of a separate shapes file. Uh, so we need to use hist and uproot to generate these histograms and put them into that file. Um, also, PyChef and combine handle samples and signal differently. Um, so uh, PyChef just has, um, the only way you can tell if something is a signal is the presence of a signal strength modifier. Um, but in combine, this isn't really the case. It's more you specify with a uh, negative number uh, and the negative number will tell combine that it's a signal. Um, so you need to be able to translate between these two things as well. So going from combine to PyHF, we use this other uh, method that combine has called the data card parser. And that just creates an empty data card object for us, um, or not an empty data card object, but a, um, populated data card object because we already have the text file uh, from combine. And then we use those attributes to put that information into the JSON spec. Um, also, because we have this separate shapes file, we need to read the histogram in the shapes file using uproot and then put that explicitly into the JSON. Also, we have the difference in the single strength modifiers. So we need to actually generate single strength modifiers um, based on whether there is negative numbers that indicate the presence of signal strength um, in each sample in the data card. And additionally, um, we, need, we need to handle combined systematics like uh, log uniform, which aren't supported in PyHF, and then just raise an error to the user because uh, if those things are included in the data card and then they're not translated to PyHF, you're gonna get some differences in the fits, which, which we don't want. Um, so important differences, um, we have uncertainty modifiers in PyChef called stat error and shapesys, uh, which are essentially just global uncertainties. Um, they're handled differently in combine. It's called auto MC stats. Um, so basically the difference is that the PyChef values are centered at one, and then they're directly are, uh, multiplied by the nominal sample. And then in combine, the values are centered at zero. 
and then they're added on to the nominal sample. So you just need to do this conversion um, to compare the fit values. Um, additionally, Combine implements this thing called a shape norm split. Um, so basically, whenever you have an uncertainty that's um, based in a histogram, um, what Combine automatically will create a normalization factor that basically brings the histogram the data in the history of uncertainty back down to the nominal count or back up to the nominal count um, and just multiplies that normalization factor. But PyGef doesn't create that normalization factor automatically. Um, so when you're going from combined to PyGef, you need to create this normalization factor manually. And if you're going from PyGef to combine, then you just need to turn this feature off if the normalization factor is not in there. Um, also, um, uh, the specification of these shape uncertainties and combine, um, they can be, um, when you specify with shape only, uh, then combine automatically does the split, but you have to use shape question mark um, to kind of tell it that, you know, there's uh, a only a shape or two different uh, shape and uh, modifier, like multiplicative modifier. So um, finally, after I wrote the translation, I had to validate that it actually worked. Um, so first I generated these negative log likelihood plots, um, basically just um, the model telling you how likely uh, certain data is given a single strength modifier. Um, and I ran into some speed bumps with this, but eventually uh, after working through them, was able to get the likelihoods to match. Uh, additionally, I calculated the expected yields in each model that were uh, translated and they also agreed. And finally, do, I did a round trip translation. So going from PyCHEF to combine back to PyCHEF and the specifications did match uh, in the workspace. So we were all good there. Finally, I made a, um, a realistic size model and created a pull plot on that. Um, as you can see, in many cases, the pulls, the pulls are fairly close, um, but in PyHF, they're a little bit farther in some places. So the pulls are actually uh, greater than zero, uh, whereas in combined, they're largely just zero across the board. Um, this is likely due to the prefit values that combined gives, um, which are slightly closer to or which are very much closer to the post-fit values um, than PyCHEF uses, because PyCHEF just uses zero or one. Um, but this kind of difference needs to be further investigated uh, to further validate the translation. Uh, so some closing remarks. Um, the success of this project obviously is very big for high energy physics in general, because um, now everybody has option to use PyHF or Combine uh, to display and analyze their data um, and take advantage of the nuances and the advantages of each one. Um, anybody can do this. The script is available for public use on GitHub. So my GitHub is listed here. Um, you can just take the script from there. And also I published the script as a Python package on PyPI. So it can also be installed from there using pip install IHF combined converter. Um, so thank you guys for listening. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, thank you, Peter. Any any questions for Peter? Uh, just a comment. Nice, nice talk. Um, this certainly enables uh, uh, CMS to leverage the PyHF infrastructure. It's a really nice step forward. Thank you. Um, okay. Before you get started, um, Alex, Alex, you was one of his mentors. Do you want to say anything about today's work? Oh, sure. Yeah, I can. I can briefly uh, introduce the uh, the work here. Yeah. So it was it was great actually working on this project um, for for MadMiner. So where this came up was kind of that uh, MadMiner is an existing tool. Uh, that's been used for a while, and then we found out that there are some limitations actually in the morphing that is implemented there. 
uh, that was developed, who is also developing, uh, who is also here in this uh, meeting. And then the obvious project was like, okay, we know that there's better ways to uh, do the morphing. Uh, we know how to do them in principle. We just need to put them into MapMiner. We need someone to do it. And uh, Jay took on this task uh, very successfully, as you'll see in this meeting now. And I think he will be able to uh, tell you all the details in the talk. Thank you. Uh, take it away. It's all yours. Okay. Yeah. So my project is the morphine enhancements for a map miner. And uh, I was under the guidance of, uh, I was mentored by Professor Kramer, Dr. Held, and Professor Kamenfeck. So um, I start with some background information. So, so map miner is a, It's a likelihood free inference tool that automates all, all steps necessary for a neural type of model, model variant inference technique. Uh, it uses simulated events that can be related to describe distributions with different values for the physics parameter of interest. And here's a GitHub link to the MapMiner repository. And for morphing, uh, morphing is that for a class of models where the squared matrix elements can, fact can be factorized into a sum over n components. And a morphing technique allows us to calculate event weights anywhere in the primary space precisely with a certain number of known values. And MapMiner implements this morphing technique, technique and leverages it, it extensively. And the, the, the square matrix element is evaluated at n different known points in the parameter space. Then my miner automates the necessary process internally to interpolate to any other parameters in the point. So you can see that the, um, the picture in the bottom that the black dots on the picture are the basis points or the benchmark points that we input. And we're able to interpolate to the uh, any other points in the parameter space. And here's a bird eye view for the map miner. And uh, it, it was in the simulation machine learning and inference. And here we can see that the morphine comes in at, for the observables to, evalu to, to evaluate the distributions of observables with any value of theta parameters. And here's my project proposal. So previously the morphing requires an inflexible number of default physics parameter values needed to use. And as a result, we, we obtain a low statistics at some points in the parameter space and significant deviation in cross sections in the regions far from the basis points. Thus we propose to implement a new approach that relaxes the requirements, which would allow researchers to pick additional physics parameter values as basis points while still being able to relate to any other position in the parameter space. The more norm basis points we input, the more accurate the predicted value we will get. Uh, so uh, here's how morphine works. So the equation up here is, um, is the multiplication of the morphine matrix and the copy matrix. And uh, the, the results will be unity for the basis samples. So if we want to get the morphine matrix, um, all, all we need to do is to do the inverse of the copy matrix. And this works fine for the standard morphine with M base equals to M main equals to three. However, for if we want to input, input more basis points, um, we, we can see that the results will be a, a rectangular matrix and thus it is not invertible and we are not able to get a morphic matrix in the same way as before. Yeah, so the problem is um, the, the same as I mentioned earlier, we will encounter a problem that the matrix we get from the calculation is not invertible. So uh, one, so, the least, the least square solution is a way to uh, resolve the issue and uh, with some oops, with some mathematical transformation, uh, we are able to get the pseudo inverse of the matrix A, uh, which is the, in, the inverse of the A dot transpose times A and times matrix A. It's the pseudo inverse of the A. 
However, the uh, there are also problems with the least uh, square solution. The first is that the condition number is to, is to, um, is increased to the square of the original matrix to the level of, to to the square level of the original matrix, which is greatly greatly increased and may lose precision. And also, uh, the eight transpose times a can be not positively positive, positive defined because of the runoff. And QR factorization is a way to address this issue. So uh, we factorize the matrix A into QR with uh, M by N and M by N. And the Q the transpose, where the Q, the transpose times Q equals to I, and R is a non square alpha triangle matrix. So uh, this equation here is the same as we get as uh, is is the same equation that's shown on the previous slide that we get for the um, pseudo inverse of the matrix A, and it is derived from this equation. And if we apply QR factorization on this equation directly uh, with some like mathematical pro process, um, we're we're able to get the uh, we're able to get this this new equation, which is. Um, which is able to produce the same results as the before, but it can it is much more stable against runoff in comparison with the normal equations, and also the condition number is reduced uh, is reduced to the same level as before. Um, yeah, and the application the application of this QR technique is uh, is able to Give the result that was high precision identical to the least square technique. So here are some my implementation parts, and so I modified and added the proposed overly summary morphing functionality to the MapMiner library. I also added the automated test for the existing and new morphing functionality. I also added a tutorial file uh, for showing the functionality and for future users to reference. And here's the link. Um, in addition to the proposed goals of the project, we, uh, when, when we were doing the implementation, we realized that the original implemented morphing technique could only handle the same coupling groups in production and decay. And so we also modified code so they can let users specify the specific groups of production, decay, or both will still be able to backward compatible with the previous info format. Here are some, here are some um, files that have been changed or added to the MapMiner repository and the, the link to, to, the, to there. And here are some results comparison that um, from on the graph at uh, left, we can, so uh, for this specific example that uh, M base equals to five is the standard morphing and the other two are the over determined morphing that we can input like more, more basis points for it for use. So we can see that uh, for the standard morphing, uh, the value we get out of the sample, sample range will vary significantly from the simulated value. However, if, if we input like more points, uh, for example, M base seven, we can see that the uh, predict value is, is uh, the difference between the predict value and the simulated value is are greatly reduced. And for the M base 15, which is the all the sample size we input here, we will get like uh, very close results um, overall. Um, And the the left graph here is that NF divided by N total measures uh, how effective our contribution of basis samples is that it is at the given point. Uh, we can see that uh, while the standard morphine with M base five can achieve can achieve some uh, ideal results uh, on the input basis sample on the input sample. On the input examples, 
uh, the M-based Eagle 7, the over-determined morphing, demonstrates higher efe efficiency in the wider range. And the graph on the right here, um, so equi equivalent sample size equals to the number of events in the base samples times um, these values here. And equivalent sample size is the number of events which reproduces the statistical co fluctuations at a given points. And in general, the greater the, this value will, will get and the better statics we will get. So we can see that the um, we, we are able to get the higher results for the better results for the MBX equals to seven in the over determined morphine. And here are some references and thank you. Oh, thank you, Zay. Uh, any, any questions? No questions? I guess I'll ask my my standard question. Uh, what 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 was uh, what was something interesting you learned during your project this summer? Oh, uh, I certainly learned lots of stuff this summer. I I indeed learned many things about the physics formula, and also I learned a lot about like the implementation in Python of as well as using the. Um, IDE and GitHub and all these skills. Um, I'm, I really also enjoy working with uh, Professor Kramer and Dr. Held and Professor Kamalplik. They really taught me a lot and I'm really grateful for having this opportunity. Okay, thank you. I, I have one, one thing to add here for this project in particular because I think it's quite interesting. So we started out here with a fairly clear goal, right? We want to add this additional technique. And then by looking at what existed already in more detail, found out then, okay, actually what's there right now makes some assumptions and we can even add new features for people who don't want the new technique, but who want to use the existing technique and it helps those as well. So it's a really nice example where spending some time looking into detail at, at what's there already reveals there's extra gains to be had which then also were, were implemented here successfully. So I think it's a really nice example where you can gain more out of the project than uh, you started out uh, even, even wanting to. So yeah, ideal if it goes like that. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Thank you for the talk, good talk. Um, my name is Natalie. I am going to be a third year physics major at UC Berkeley this fall. Um, my project was working on reducing fake tracks for the muon collider detector. And I was working with Carol Krishka and Simone Pagan Griso and Sergo Jandariani. Um, so, some background on the project is that. Um, a proposed muon collider is a very promising option for future high energy physics experiments because muons have certain properties that create really high energy collisions. Um, for example, while proton collisions occur between proton constituents, um, so the energy is divided between them, muons are leptons, so the entire center of mass energy is available in the collision. Um, additionally, the full initial momentum of the muons is known. So if you look at this figure here, you can see um, that the same cross section is achieved by a muon collider at a much lower energy, about 15 TeV, as a proton collider at closer to 100 TeV. So you can see that there's um, some good scientific potential with the muon collider. Um, one of the big problems with the muon collider is that muons have a finite lifetime um, and as they decay, they produce a multitude of particles that then strike the detector. Um, and all these particles are known as beam-induced background. Um, this is a simulated image of what the beam-induced background looks like in the detector. You can see that there are a lot of particles pictured here. Um, we have order of 10 to the eighth per bunch crossing of muons. And the different types of particles are shown with different colors. So you can see that the decay products include photons, neutrons, electrons, and positrons. 
Um, this is a closer up image of the interaction point, and you can see the detector is designed to block a lot of the beam induced background with this nozzle, but we still have a lot of extra particles. Um, and they kind of block the collision products or obscure the collision products, which are what we're actually interested in studying. Um, this table shows the hit density of the muon collider detector compared to the Atlas detector, which sort of has the largest hit density we kind of currently know how to handle. Um, and you can see the muon collider detector has significantly higher hit density for every, for all three parts of the detector. Um, so my project uses ACTS as a starting point to reconstruct the tracks that these charged particles take through the detector. Um, in the past, ILC soft has been used for this type of reconstruction. Um, and ACTS is a modern library that's optimized for efficiency. You can see in this table that the actual fitting time is a bit faster for ACTS. Um, ACTS implements a combinatorial Kalman filter algorithm to do the reconstruction. Um, and it does a good job, but you can see that when we're simulating just a single muon gun, we should only have one reconstructed track, but um, we end up with over 100,000 because of all these beam induced background particles that also leave hits in the detector. So the goal of this project was to maximize the reconstruction efficiency um, while minimizing what we call fake tracks from beam induced background. Um, so this is what the layout of the detector looks like. Um, this is the interaction point where the collision happens. And then these horizontal lines represent concentric cylinders or barrels around the interaction point. And then these vertical lines represent disks that cap the ends of the barrels. Um, so the all silicon tracking detector here is, um, it has three parts. The first is the outer tracker, which are made up of these layers. And then the inner tracker is here. And the vertex detector is closest to the interaction point here. Um, this is a close up of the vertex detector. You can see it has, you can see the barrel like structure a little more clearly here and then um, it's made up of these double layers. And this helps actually to get rid of some of the beam induced background already because those particles tend to have a lower energy and they don't always make it through both layers. And then those hits are not recorded. Um, so this table talks about the size of the cells in each tracker. Um, they get larger as you go out and the outer tracker is actually made of strips and not cells. Um, and it also says the time and spatial resolution for each part, which gets worse as you go on. Um, so when I'm talking about transverse momentum, just to note that means momentum in this direction. And then um, lambda is this angle. Lambda is zero um, straight up in this plot and 90 degrees over here. So the way I went about reducing the number of fake tracks was by adding a new processor called filter tracks, um, which takes an input collection of tracks and filters it based on certain discriminating parameters. And these are the distributions of the five parameters I started with. Um, the orange histograms represent the fake tracks from beam induced background and the blue ones are the real tracks. Um, an important note is that there are many, many more fake tracks than real tracks, but these are normalized so that we can just compare the distributions. Um, so how I went about it at first was just um, looking at these plots and making cuts where it looked like we'd get rid of most, the most orange possible and keep the most blue possible. So we have the momentum of the tracks and the total number of hits that the particles leave in the detector and then the total number of hits on each subdetector down here. Yeah, so hopefully those cuts make visual sense. And then here are the results of that. So by cutting those five parameters, the average number of fake tracks per event went from about 134,000 to about 0 0.08. Um, you can see exactly where we lose the fake tracks and where we made the cuts. You can see low number of hits, low momentum, 
And then particles that have um, higher lambda values seem to also be cut. Um, so unfortunately, but not unexpectedly, the average efficiency also took quite a hit. We went from about 93% efficiency to 64% efficiency. Although this is the average efficiency and you can see we're losing mostly um, efficiency from particles with lower momentums. And also it seems particles again in the forward regions or with larger lambda values. So the loss in efficiency isn't ideal, even though we did cut a lot of fakes as well. So um, what we wanted to try was optimizing these cuts with an evolutionary algorithm instead of just making them by hand. Um, this type of algorithm has been used before for, for optim optimizing tracking algorithms. Um, and how it works is you have a population of parameter sets. So we had 50 individuals that look something like this. And then there's a tournament phase where you basically choose the individuals that have best score. And what I mean by best score in this case is the efficiency minus the number of fakes because we want to maximize efficiency and minimize number of fakes. And then you can weight these based on which you want to value more. And then there's a mutate phase where um, each individual has a probability of being changed. And then once it's chosen to be changed, each parameter inside has a probability of being altered. Um, and then you just repeat the cycle. So you change individuals, choose the best ones over and over, and hopefully you have a high scoring population of parameter sets. So here's, here are the results of that. Um, instead of trying to balance fakes and efficiency, we decided to choose a couple benchmark efficiencies and then um, just minimize the number of fakes from there. So you can you kind of have a range of low fakes or high efficiency. Um, I think you can see the algorithm working kind of the nicest and at the 70%, we start pretty high because we're not making any cuts and then it drops to um, what we told it was the minimum efficiency allowed. And then you can see the number of fakes is also hopefully minimizing. And in this case, the score represents just the number of fakes because we're just focusing on minimizing fakes. So the score is hopefully maximizing. Um, so for 90% efficiency, these were the winning parameters. Um, the cut is at 0.5 GeV for momentum and then six hits. Um, you can see for 80% efficiency, both of those cuts increase. And then something kind of interesting is that for 90% efficiency, um, the number of hits cut stays the same. And then we just start cutting these low momentum particles more. Um, we can look at the efficiencies plots. You can see that, um, Again, the high momentum particles efficiencies are staying a bit more constant and the change really happens down here. You can see for 70%, the efficiency is zero below about 1.82 GeV. And then um, we can also look at the number of fakes. So again, before the filter, we had about 134,000 per event. Um, at 90% efficiency, we got it down to 3,900. 80%, 0 0.13, 70%, 0 0.06 fakes per event. Um, and again, you can see where those fakes are coming out of. And then just a note is that earlier when cutting by hand, we were at about 64% efficiency and about 0 0.08 fakes per event. So we did improve on this um, result. A way that this algorithm could be improved further is by including um, spatial chi-squared information. So um, you can see that there's a difference here between these two histograms. And so we could further maybe refine our results by adding in more parameters that have discrimination. Um, something else that could be added in is timing information. So timing information is already used sort of before tracking to get rid of beam-induced background that um, hit the detector before the interaction happened. So they couldn't come from the interaction point. Um, 
but we could also access two consecutive hits on a track and look at the timing there. So we can look at their measured positions, um, calculate the expected time between the hits based on the positions, and we approximate the track as a straight line instead of a helix. Um, and then just compare this expected time with the measured time between hits. And hopefully there would be a difference between fake tracks and real tracks. Hopefully real tracks would have these two quantities would align more than fake tracks. Um, so some conclusions for this part of the project are that cutting fakes comes with a cost on efficiency, which isn't surprising. Um, and then once a cut on n hits total is made at about nine hits, it seems like the most efficient way to start reducing fakes is to just cut low momentum particles. Um, additionally, the filter could be refined further with um, spatial chi-squared and timing information. And those timing cuts could be incorporated into the actual track fitting instead of being done afterwards as well. So another strategy that we tried um, to reduce fake tracks is called outside in tracking. Um, currently the track seeds are found using the vertex detector down here, which as you can see from this table that I had earlier, the Vertex detector has a much higher hit density than the outer tracker out here. And so the idea is kind of that there's a lower hit density, so we might have fewer seeds and then fewer fake tracks. Um, and this is called outside in tracking because we begin, we seed the tracks out here, and then we propagate them inwards instead of the other way around, which is what we were doing earlier. Um, so because there are many differences between the vertex detector and the outer tracker, we had to change um, some of the parameters to make it work. Um, so first, what I already talked about is the layers we use for seeding change from the vertex detector to the outer tracker. Um, the R max and Z max um, had to be increased. That's the the distance that we include for seeding. So before it just had to include this vertex detector, this had to be increased to include the outer tracker. Um, the delta R max is the radial distance between layers. So that also had to be increased for the outer tracker compared to the vertex detector. Propagate backwards just means we start out here and propagate inwards. Um, the initial track error position we increased because, as I mentioned earlier, um, the spatial resolution of the outer tracker is much larger than for the vertex detector. A um, couple more parameters that we changed. So the, um, the algorithm will eliminate tracks that don't seem to come from the interaction point which on this plot is right here. And how it figures that out is it takes two hits that are used in the seed, um, two hits that are next to each other, and it just draws a straight line through them, even though the track is a helix. And then if it's within some distance from the interaction point, it, it will keep it. And if not, it gets rid of it. So you can see that if this process happens down here at the vertex detector close to the interaction point, this distance will be much smaller than if we do it out here at the outer tracker. Um, so that's why we had to increase the collision region. And then the last parameter we changed was the minimum momentum for particles. Um, particles with a low momentum won't make it to these outer layers. And so we had to increase that to account for that. So the performance of outside in tracking, it turned out that it actually has more seeds and more fake tracks and a lower efficiency, unfortunately. Um, and it also takes quite a bit longer to complete the tracking step compared to inside out. It takes about twice as long, a little over twice as long. Um, so some conclusions for outside in is that our initial assumption that the outside in tracking would have fewer seeds was not right, at least with the current parameters we're using. Um, there are quite a few parameters we haven't touched yet, um, and it's possible some of the values we did choose weren't optimal. And so there's a possibility of using um, the evolutionary algorithm I talked about earlier to optimize these parameters and even optimize which 
layers we start with instead of maybe instead of starting with the outer layers, it'd be better to start with the inner chakra layers, the middle part. Um, but we did not complete this this summer because of how long the outside in reconstruction actually takes. Um, outside in tracking is still needed for particles with displaced tracks that actually don't leave hits on the vertex detector. Um, and it's currently not optimal, the outside in tracking, but it is possible. Um, so some final conclusions are that I used two different methods of reducing fake tracks. Um, one was inside out tracking using the track filter and then also using the evolutionary algorithm for optimization. Um, and we saw that reduction in fakes comes with a loss of efficiency, especially from removing low momentum particles. Um, and it could still be further improved with spatial chi-squared cuts or timing cuts. Um, and then also outside in tracking, didn't work quite as expected, but it will impact track reconstruction of displaced particles. So thanks, that's all I have. All right, thank you, Natalie. Um, impressive amount of work there, uh, a nice talk. Anybody have any questions for Natalie? All right. Um, I, know, I guess I'll ask my standard question since somebody asked a question. Um, so, I mean, it looks like you did a lot of a lot of work this summer. What was what were some things you found the most interesting in the in your project? Um, I definitely learned a lot. Um, I didn't know too much about particle collisions to begin with, so I learned a lot about that. Um, and it was also very interesting to I was using a supercomputer. Um, so I learned a lot about how to use that and a lot, I was using root to analyze um, files, which I've never used. So I definitely learned a lot of new things. Nice. nice. It's one of the things where we hope so when yeah. we, we do these projects. So, right. all right. Thank you. Uh, okay. So my name is Zion. I am a, I'm a graduate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which means computer science. My project was adding network matching to data federation patches. And Brian Lynn is my mentor, who is from UW Madison, is OSG software team manager. Okay, so, uh, first, let me provide some background information. So LHC experiments will bring a huge increase in data volume. The experiments will need to store data on distributed data federations consisting of caches and organs to efficiently transfer and reuse experimental data. Such data federation is provided by OSG Experimental data is streamed from data organs to distributed data caches all over the world. By accessing such data caches near a user's location, rather than data organs directly, users can achieve relatively um, low latency and high data transfer speed. So the project goal is to deploy network matching tooling for the data federations so that users can get to know how well the data access is working in their data caches. So this project is separated, separated into two stages. The first part is to set up two sonar incidences on two different dimensions. And the second part is to schedule some actual network measuring tests to them. And what is Sonar? Sonar is a network measuring toolkit for testing end-to-end -end network performance. It can test and monitor all the nodes on the network paths and look for areas of low performance. Users can set up various test types based on test purposes. So for example, you can set up the latency tests, throughput tests, etc. 
So I started the project with deploying some test data caches and sonar containers locally on my laptop using Docker to get a sense of how them work. Um, Docker is an open source application container engine that allows developers to package own applications in a unified form, which provides an easy approach for researchers to set up their own data caches and the net network meshing toolkit. Um, so I start uh, to I start to build a sonar image that pulls data uh, test conflicts from web admin. Then the sonar can be deployed inside a container. As you can see here, um, I can build a uh, network meshing toolkit locally with an image on my laptop. Um, but the problem is that data cache and sonar are in two different containers uh, when deployed locally. They need a way to communicate with each other so they can start the actual network meshing. So here comes the next step. The next step is to orchestrate the data cache and sonar container using Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a management system that provides um, flexible control of Docker containers. What I did is to deploy sonar container alongside a data cache container inside a Kubernetes cluster. A Kubernetes cluster is a set of nodes that run containerized applications. Um, containerized applications package app, uh, an app with its dependencies and some necessary services. They are more lightweighted and flexible than virtual machines. The, the Kubernetes cluster can provide necessary configurations to those containers. In this case, data cache and sonar um, to perform um, network measuring tasks, tasks between caches. And the most significant significant parts of this step are setting up big IPs and open required uh, network ports so that container inside can communicate with other nodes outside of the cluster. So first, I deployed a container on Titan cluster, which is located at Uda Medicine. As you can see here, um, a sonar container is co-deployed with a data cache inside a uh, Renetti cluster. Then, then I deployed another one on River cluster, which is located at New Chicago. Then I move to the second stage of the project, scheduling network measuring tests. Um, then I need to introduce PS Config Web Admin. Uh, it is a web-based UI for Sonar users to define and publish PS Config meshes, which um, automates tests executed by test nodes and provides information to various services on Sonar. Um, so um, users can um, set up and give the public IPs of the test nodes to web app. Then the Sonar on clusters will be able to receive such conflicts and schedule corresponding tests. And during the process, there were some major issues I encountered. First is that the container inside the Kubernetes cluster does not usually run properly with new code added in. Sometimes it just stuck in some failing states and it will not uh, uh, start running until you restart the pod or you need to check the cluster configuration for specific errors. 
Similarly, container uh, sometimes reports no scheduled tests or receive no test conflicts from web admin. The key is that the public IP set up previously only tells the web admin which Kubernetes cluster it is talking to, not the specific container. So it is essential to config the container to know what is its public address. And also it is important to make sure uh, the correct ports are open inside of the container. And also, um, you have to make sure the upstream sonar image that fills the container you use provides, provides full services for network tests, or otherwise some specific tests will not be scheduled inside of the container. Yes, so is in, in the end of the project, the sonar incidences on the to cluster was able to pull test config from web admin and schedule the test based on the config. As you can see here, um, there is a source, there is a uh, destination, there's a test scheduled between these two data caches. And this is the tools the test can use. And you have to open course based on the, it, the tools, the tools it used. And there's also possible future work. A central measurement archive is needed to save test output. For now, the test output can only be saved locally at the test point. And the problem is that the output will um, be deleted shortly after the test is completed. So we, uh, we need to set up a archive to save those output. Yeah, that will be all. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Z uh, Ziyang. Uh, any, any questions? Uh, I guess I have a I have a question. So you said we had those major issues encountered. So what what is what steps did you have to take to sort of like fix those errors and or were you able to like automate any of those checks or anything like that? Well, it depends on like what is issues you encounter. Like um, you are not uh, this container is not scheduling any tests. It may cause by you did not uh, specify the public IP of the container. So you have to tell the container what is its public address. So there were a lot of like container related issues. It depends on what you are seeing. Okay. Uh, and uh, Rob was asking a question. Yeah. Uh, this is Brian Lin, uh, Zhiyang's mentor. Uh, and I wanted to add on to Zhiyang's answer uh, and that there are a couple of different classes of, of problems that, that we encountered. One were, were just kind of Kubernetes related things that were specific to the, the way our, our Kubernetes was, was deployed, uh, like, hooking up different volumes to the different pods, making sure that the networking uh, objects were set up correctly because Kubernetes networking is very confusing. So part of it was, was a learning experience for Xeon to, to get familiar with, with Kubernetes itself and, and, our, and the way we deployed it. Uh, and then there were some issues with the, the perf sonar containers that, that we were using. Uh, ourselves um, that we we started off with some upstream containers from from Perfstone our developers or uh, that that didn't work quite so well in a Kubernetes environment 
Uh, and then we coordinated with uh, some folks at the PRP who have their own Kubernetes container. Um, and so there was a lot of, a couple of meetings with PRP, to, uh, yeah, the PRP folks, and then also Perfsonar folks to, to help us uh, overcome these hurdles. And um, we, we didn't get around to it, but, but we hope to pass some of these issues along um, up to the, the upstream developers uh, post this, this project. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, yes, sorry, Brian, we, we, we got a little ahead of schedule, so you didn't get a chance to introduce. So maybe, uh, actually, Brian, while you're here, you wanna, do you wanna add anything additional to what um, was presented or, or say anything about your experience this summer with the project? Oh, you know, I, I think I, I mean, with talking with Zhang, that I, I think he he learned quite a bit. And I hope he, he was telling <laughs> telling the truth on that and, and just being nice. Uh, but there's there's a lot of Kubernetes and container foundational knowledge that that we had to um, set up before before really being able to make a, a lot of progress on on this particular project and. And we didn't get it quite as far as we wanted, we, but we were able to successfully, you know, show that that tests were were able to run between two different Kubernetes um, uh, clusters. Um, and so there is still uh, some work left to do uh, to to make the you know put this into production. Um, but uh, with Zhang's work, I, I think we've overcome a, a lot of of the issues, like I mentioned with the Perfsonar container. So it was, it was very helpful having him uh, contribute this summer. Well, good. That's what we like to hear. So, um... so uh, hello, everyone. My name is Philip Tumpeman, and over the summer, I was working on analysis preservation with Kyle Cranmer, Matthew Fetkart, and my specific project was creating a Rihanna workflow for the Minerva Pion analysis. And I think a good place to start with just the basics of a workflow. So I divide this into three basic parts just for your understanding. The first is actual workflow structure. I like to think of that as what we're actually doing and what order we're doing that in. So it has all the code that we're running and also specifies which inputs and outputs we use for each step. And then the next part is the Docker container. That's actually, and go back for a second to the workflow structure that contains like the commands you put in, but the Docker container is what actually has the physical software that you're using. So that's, how you're actually calculating everything. So not only does it have your specific analysis code, but also all the dependencies. So for example, the operating system and we'll go into that later. And then finally, we have the Rihanna cluster. That's uh, the physical location this is actually run. So I was running this on the Rihanna instance at CERN. And that's just a cluster of computers where we can divide up the tasks among all of them to get it done faster. And that's really important for how these workflows are useful in the real field. Now, I think first place we want to start is explaining the Docker image. So just a little vocabulary here. An image is basically the code behind the container. So you build the image and then when you actually run it, it's turned into a container, which you can kind of think of as a virtual computer, which has all the software you need to run the code. So the construction of this is done in many layers. The first layer is your operating system. So I just used a Linux operating system. On top of that, I also added a layer for root, since that's really important for these analyses. And a little bit more to how you do these when you're making a Docker image, you actually reference a base image. You don't build it entirely by scratch. So for some of them, you could use a Linux system base image. We actually used an image with root on it as well. So this, what you see right here, was my starting point. The next on top of those, 
I added the Minerva Analysis Toolkit, which is a set of software that's been created for a bunch of different Minerva analyses, as well as some other ones. And that just has a lot of useful tools for creating histograms and calculating cross sections. And then on top of that, there's an additional layer, which has the actual analysis as running. That was based on Ben Metherly's charge pion analysis, which is a very specific analysis of calculating cross sections from the neutrino and pion data from Minerva. And now finally, outside of this, there is a little more code, which is the workflow code that's in the yachtage language, and it's set up in a bunch of YAML files. And the cool thing is when you're making this Docker image, you can build it yourself. So the way I've done it is when you're running your workflow, you're going to pull this image from the Docker repository. So you can either use the pre-built image that I provided, or you can rebuild parts of the image by yourself if you want to change, for example, some of the analysis code. And rebuilding that, you only have to rebuild the layer you're rebuilding and all the ones on top of that. So for example, you could change that analysis code, only take maybe two or three minutes to rebuild the image and push it to the hub. But if you wanted to like reinstall some of the flux files that are part of the analysis toolkit and you're uploading gigabytes worth of data there, then that's going to take a lot longer to do. So that's why it's formed in layers so you can just change the top things and have it get done real fast. But the nice thing about the YAML files that are outside of that Docker container is you can change parameters in those files and not have to rebuild anything at all. So you can just change a few things, rerun run your workflow, and work just fine with new parameters. Now, moving on, I want to talk a little about how the workflow actually functions before we go into what I created. So the basic unit of this is called a packtivity. You basically have a command that takes some input parameters and publishes those outputs back to the scheduler. And that command will just do a few basic actions. And the cool thing is there's actually two types of activities. There's a single step, which is represented right here, but there's also a multi-step where you can iterate that over a certain index. And that will create also a set of outputs, which you can then merge back together in a later activity. And that's a really important part to analysis Analyses like these where you're analyzing giant data sets, so you can split that up over the cluster of computers and get the computing done much more quickly. So going into my own analysis, I'll first tell you about the four types of input parameters we use for the entire workflow. So on the left side up here, we have the data tuples and the Monte Carlo tuples. Those are input data that are created from the Minerva experiment. It's, they're stored in root files, it's truth trees. And cool thing about the data I was using is the Minerva data preservation team has been working on taking these files, which were stored on Fermilabs computers and converting them into a form that's on a public X root D cache. So this means you can just take a text file with the link of all those X root D links and then you'll be able to open these root files on any computer and you don't need the Fermilab credentials. So that's why we're able to run this on Rihanna. And the organization of those anatuple files is in the form of runs and playlists. So when the Minerva experiment was actually running, they had some trials at a bunch of different energies and that's what the playlists represent and then inside those playlists there's actually a lot of runs for the monte carlo um, the simulated data that was probably around 20 to 30 runs but in the actual data collection there's going to be upwards of maybe like 100 runs per playlist and those runs are represented by the individual root files so what i wanted to do in this workflow to make it easier to test is add some workflow options that will allow you to iterate over these individual runs. So the root files, instead of having to iterate through a playlist with hundreds of them. 
So that makes it, that means that this workflow can run a lot quicker if you're just doing a small sample of data. So you might be able to get your results in maybe about 10 minutes. And if you're running on Rihanna, more likely around 20 or 30 minutes. And that's opposed to the, I'd estimate around 60 to 90 minutes if you're running it uh, the original way. So iterating by playlist. And then you also see up here, I added some extra input parameters to do with the signal definition. So what that is calculating cross sections, we will specify um, certain parameters that we want to select for the signal. So for this analysis, in general, you'd want to choose a single positive pion because that will break down into a Michelle electron that makes it easy to identify. But it's also possible you might want to consider what if we change the signal to have more than one pion or allow for negative or neutral pions. So I added some input parameters here to make it really easy to change that if you want to do a slightly altered analysis. And all of that is sent to our first Pactivity, <coughs> which I called split anatuples. And what that does, it takes your original data files and it just runs a bash script on them to separate them into a bunch of separate text files that we can iterate over our next steps. So the output of this step is going to be a text file with some Monte Carlo runs, another one with data runs, and then a final one with just the index to make it easy to iterate over. And that index is what we use to identify which text file we are going to choose at each iteration. And the thing is, I said earlier, there are many, many more tech, um, extra D files for the data as opposed to the Monte Carlo. So what I did here is if we have more of those data files, it's going to have multiple data files per the data run text file and less files for the Monte Carlo runs text files. That way there's an equal number of each files that are sent out from this activity. And that just means that we don't have any errors further down the line. And it shouldn't impact the how quickly it runs too much because these data runs run way faster than the Monte Carlo. So if you have one here on the left and three or four on the right, it's not going to really affect how long you run. It might take just like a few minutes longer. Now, moving on, I'm going to cut out all the intermediate files just to make this a little simpler. So after the split anatuple steps, we iterate over that index and we calculate our first set of histograms just from the simulated Monte Carlo data. Then we take the output from those steps and add on our um, measured data. And using that, we can create the full histograms and also calculate our cross sections. And then finally, we take all those files they are going to be root files with histograms as the outputs of that. We merge all those root files together and that creates a final set of plots that in the final step, we will plot into PNG files and that's the output we get from the workflow. Now, of course, the reason I made this is to make it really easy to run, especially from the standpoint of someone who doesn't know this analysis very well. So I, or of course, someone who doesn't know how to use the yardage language too well. So what I want to do is make it really, really easy for someone to be able to run the basic command. So I structured that as a make file. So you just type in make and then some simple commands and that will run all the basic things you need to do. So the first make command is going to run this analysis on Rihanna. So here you just need to provide your Rihanna access token and it'll automatically send that all out with the parameters you've set in your Rihanna.yaml file. And that's really useful if you just want to reproduce the analysis. But if you do want to do a significantly altered analysis, you probably will need to change some of the code that's inside the Docker image. So to do that, you have to rebuild the Docker container. But that's pretty easy. You just need to have the analysis code you want cloned over to the directory you're working in for the workflow. 
And then this makefile command will take that directory, packages up into the Docker file, and send that off. And then finally, also added a make command for testing on your local system as well, because I found that if you're just doing a um, an input set of data of maybe one or two runs, you can run that really quickly on your computer, and it'd take probably 10 minutes longer if you're lucky trying to run that on the Rihanna cluster. So that was really helpful for debugging anything in the analysis. Now, of course, I have run this just to make sure it works, and it's promising. Here on the left, we have an example plot. This is one of the first histograms you calculate. It's representative of the momentum of the muon along the z-axis, which is where the neutrinos are actually traveling. And this is actually one of the inputs that you need for the ventral cross-sections. Sadly, right now, we can't get the final cross-section graphs. There's some type of bug, so I'm still tracking it down. So hopefully in the next few weeks, I'll get that fixed up and we'll have the rest of the results as well. And in the future, so a few months down the line, once I get that bug fixed, I'm planning on working on a different type of analysis using this workflow. So maybe analyze Minerva data for the anti-neutrinos. That wasn't done in the analysis I'm looking at now. And it's possible also to look at a different kind of neutrino interaction. So this analysis looks at charge current interaction, but you could also look at coherent interaction of that neutrino with the entire nucleus. And this workflow has the basis you need to start an analysis like that. You just have to change some of the cuts you're making and such. Now, to wrap things up, just want to go back to those three basic parts I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. So, of course, on the left, our workflow structure that defines when we're doing things, what commands we're running. In the middle, the Docker container that contains all the software we're using for this analysis. One place we can just pull from the Docker hub and have that all loaded up. We don't need to worry about installing anything. So you can run this regardless of your operating system. And finally, the Rihanna cluster, that is what takes place of our own computers and running this so it has the computer power and also that cluster to be able to run this really quickly and efficiently. And finally, I would like to just thank some people as well as some references. So I did use a few example um, workflows to help create this one because there's not too much documentation out there for yachtage quite yet. So I use some of the demo Rihanna ones that are found on their website. I also found the Docker tutorial that Matthew Fickhart made really useful in understanding how to structure my Docker image. So it was the most efficient as I could make it. And of course, I'd like to thank my research advisor here at Notre Dame, Professor Fields, for helping me with the ion analysis part of this experiment, as well as the authors of that could Ben Meserly and Everardo Granados. I'd also like to thank everyone here at Iris Hep who helped me. So Kyle Cranmer, Matthew Fetkart, and Lucas Heinrich. And finally, the data preservation team from Minerva for helping me find the input data I need to, to use. So any of you have any questions about that? Uh, not a question, but just a comment. Uh, I think it, this is, uh, so I think, this was a really nice project um, uh, that Philip did a great job on. And also, it's really exciting to see because pre basically previously, there's only been Atlas analyses that have been running on uh, Rihanna. So to now see that Minerva is also kind of uh, uh, being able to do this work as well is, I think, uh, super excellent. Uh, uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, questions? Uh, Alex and uh, Carol? I guess uh, I don't know who's first, so I'll go with Alex. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for this very nice talk. Um, I'm wondering uh, about the data that you're using here. 
is that publicly available data that sort of anyone can go and use or do you need special permissions and the, the background the reason for why i'm asking this the, the experiment that i'm working on you can't easily get access to the data so i'm curious uh, how this works here yeah so that's one thing i'm really excited about as i mentioned i was working with the data preservation team and one of their big projects recently has been creating the production version of the anatuples used in the experiment. So I'm not even sure if they have that project quite finished yet, but in probably just a few more months, they're planning on having the data from all of the Minerva playlists available publicly. And the way you access that and the way I used it in this workflow is you just have an extra D link and that's a public cache as opposed to a private one as they were previously. So yes, the data from all of this part of the Minerva experiment is publicly available. That's great to hear, thanks. Okay. Uh, Carol, you heard your hand raised? Yeah. Uh, so, so this is something I always wondered about these analysis preservation projects that are based on Docker, right? The goal here is that, you know, to make this reproducible, you know, years later. Um, and there's always, there's this dependency, external dependency of the base layer. Uh, is it a safe assumption to assume that the, for example, the Ubuntu base layer will be available, you know, 10 years on? Or is there some effort to actually have a backup of that on, on like a certain server or something? Yeah, so the way the base layer is created is it's made in a Docker file just like I'd use to create this analysis. But that Docker file was actually created by, I believe they would have been developers of Linux who would have no, Ubuntu, uploaded yeah. a Docker version to the Docker hub. and. I'm talking about the Docker Hub. What that is, it's kind of like GitHub. It's a repository where you can keep these Docker files and then you pretty easily just download your image from there and can run it. So as long as it's still on the Docker Hub, it's the exact same in 10 years. Yeah, but my point is, will Docker Hub exist in 10 years, right? <laughs> we hope it will. I'm, about I'm it. pretty sure it will. But it'd be like the same thing as saying, if what if GitHub didn't exist then? Uh, so, commercial uh, companies, right? It is. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if I can kind of follow up on this, I mean, I think two points. Uh, so, number one, you can tag. Um, uh, so, in addition to just like, you know, saying like, okay, I want like Ubuntu 2204 or something, you can also specify additional hashes to get a much more kind of consistent reproducible base build and just to the question of like are these external services um uh, are they going to be around forever uh the, so j as you know we all know nothing is around forever but um the it, to answer carol's question on like can you create mirrors then the answer is yeah sure it's a it's a simply just a collection of zip files you can shove them anywhere you want you can uh, and so if you uh if docker hub goes poof then it's a basically if you have mirrors that i don't uh which you know there's already mirrors uh around the world it's kind of a trivial uh, rewrite of a single line to be able to pull them. Sure. But okay, but as a head community, are we making sure that we will always have a mirror, right? Are we making a mirror ourselves? Because right? depending on the external services, either Docker Hub or, you know, goodness of heart of some, you know, other community. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily know if that's something that, like, we need to ask CERN to do. Um, I mean, there's, it, uh, so yeah, this is maybe a question for offline discussion, yeah, but, course, um, yeah, yeah the, the short answer is no, uh, but because it's not necessarily feasible to ask CERN to archive, uh, a copy of every image that exists on the internet. Yeah. Um, but there's, uh, but I guess the question is, do you need to, because for the same reason that you don't need to necessarily have a, a, a clone of every GitHub repository that exists. Yeah. But it, it is a good point though, is that uh, long-term stability requires long-term stability of resources. So. Yes. 
And it would be a little more difficult to be storing these images somewhere else because the way the Docker Hub structured is it only has to have the data, I believe it only has to have the data for your actual image on top of the base image and the base image they can just reference somewhere else. I think that's how it works. So it makes it for smaller sizes. Alex had a point in chat that OSG has a repo for images. Uh, Alex, can you elaborate on that a little bit? No, not really. I, I would have to look <laughs> up the details. I'm, I'm pretty sure there is a project, it's called Haba or something like this, that uh, provides images. And the other advantage of that is that you don't run into rate limitations if you pull lots of images that you run into with Docker Hub when you're not paying. So yeah, yeah. I, I think I think there exists some things in this space, but I'm not familiar with the details. Nevis, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the talks. Uh, nice job, Philip. Uh, uh, anyone else? All right. That's all we have for today. So thank you all for your patience.